Rome had ejected the kings in the 6th century BC. Now what? Well, what you have is a continual period of expansion. And in the ensuing centuries, Rome will take over the entire peninsula. And there are very few setbacks in that enterprise. We can look on a map and see Rome and then see that the first people that they're going to be interacting with and conquering and ultimately enrolling as their allies are the people of Lazio, the people of Latium, the people that were of a very similar culture and of course shared language. From there they expanded north and came upon the Etruscans and defeated them starting with the city of Vey in 396 and they continued further south all the way to the heel fighting a series of wars as they constructed a very sophisticated road system leading them to their enemies, the Samnites. And that road was built by Appius Claudius Caicus, who then has a very important road named after him, the Queen of All Roads, the Via Appia. All roads lead to Rome, starting with this road, the Via Appia. Constructed in 312 BC, it eventually extended all the way to Brindisi. This is the road that captures the imagination and you get the feel that today you're still in ancient Rome. From the Samnite they continue down into the area of Neapolis and Capua and come across the Greeks. And these are people that are settling in southern Italy already in the 8th and 7th centuries BC. And the Romans are defeating them one by one, eventually coming down to the heel where the Greeks will ask Pyrrhus of Epirus to come over from mainland Greece to defend them. But he too is defeated by the Romans. Then you have the beginning of international wars, and the Romans cross over to Sicily, where they encounter not just more Greek kingdoms, in particular Syracuse, but also the Carthaginians. And in the series of three Punic Wars, Carthage is destroyed. Now what do we have to see in the city of Rome from all of this conquest? Where can we go and look at what is left behind by the Romans in Republican Rome? Well, we can go to the Roman Forum itself, and we can look at the Temple of Castor and Pollux, and we can look at the Temple of Saturn. Now, although what you see are imperial remains, the same location and the same scale was already present in the Republican constructions in the 5th century BC. Where else can we go besides the Roman Forum? Well, we can go over to the Forum Boari, and we can take a look at the Temple of Fortunus, and we can take a look at the Temple of Hercules. And here we have examples of small Republican temples. And this is of the scale that we have pretty much representative of most of the city outside the Roman Forum and the Republican Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. And we can look at the materials, we can look at the scale, and we can think about the individual contributions by individual generals whose vows are then sanctioned by the Senate, allowing them to build these structures. When we look at the Forum Boar, we can see two well-preserved temples, almost side by side. You get a sense of how crowded the original area was. There are many other temples that were destroyed, but these two still stand because one and the other were converted into churches in the Middle Ages. And that's an important thing to remember. Now, when we see them today, they are revealed. They are very pristine and isolated. That's because of the fascist period intervention in which many other accreted constructions, particularly medieval constructions, were destroyed to highlight these ancient monuments. Next to the Forum Boarium, we have the Forum Holitorium. We have again a series of Republican temples that are going to be rebuilt in the imperial period. But here we have two of the three still standing temple remains that are vowed and constructed already in the First Punic War. We can go over to the sacred area of Larga Argentina, where we have temples A, B, C, and D. And the beginning constructions of at least two of those temples goes back to the third century BC. Again, the size, the scale, the material, mostly lack of marble, indicates again what was going on in the building in the Republican period. And it's a very broad, expansive period. The real watershed moment, we can say, when we look at the construction of the city of Rome is the second century, when we have the conquest not just of Carthage in North Africa, modern-day Tunisia, but also over in mainland Greece. The Macedonian Wars led to further destruction and further conquest on the part of the Romans, and they're bringing back to the city of Rome loot. They're bringing back building materials, slaves on a scale that was really unimaginable in the beginning of the Republican period. It's not just the architecture that is so impressive and spread throughout the city, but it's also the sculpture. 
The ancient sources tell us of the triumphs that record the spoils of war, the slaves, the materials coming flooding into the city of Rome. Well, it's also going to include statuary. Two great examples that might be spoils of war looted from the Greek East are the Boxer and the Hellenistic Prince. The Boxer, a tired, fatigued figure, battle-scarred, is impressive today in the Museum of Plaza Massimo. Next to it, the Hellenistic Prince. Is he indeed a Hellenistic Prince? He doesn't have a diadem, but he does have an incised, light, stubble beard. He might be actually a Greek piece that's reconfigured to look like a Roman general. Variastic portraiture is a typical representation of the elder statesman in portraiture of the Republican era. You have wrinkles, you have physical blemishes, and of course the more that you have, the more weight and gravitas you have to the viewer. You also have a pastiche of styles in the portraiture, in statuary, that line the city of Rome. For example, we can look at the Tivoli General, found in the Temple of Hercules in the city of Tivoli. Here you have an aged face portrait of a general, but on the body of a much younger type. So you have a mix and match of styles, and you're conveying with that portraiture and with that body type several different attributes and characteristics. So you've got on one side the learned statesman, the person with all the experience and gravitas, and at the same time you have the virile, kind of aggressive, successful military qualities as depicted in the body. Some statuary that we find in Rome's collections today give us an indication of the spoils of war, of the glorious past that the Romans brought from other kingdoms, places that were conquered far afield and brought into the city for decoration and for worship. Very few of those kinds of statues and monuments are visible today in Rome, but when we do see them, we get an indication of the glory that was the early Republic.